Under the general heading of hysteria, two distinct conditions are obvious. There is a difference between hysteria and an hysterical situation. People uh, are hysterical very often as a result of stress, nervousness, tension, or some sudden emergency arising in their lives. Very often, the ground for it is an essentially hypersensitive nervous temperament. And everyone who has a nervous temperament should go to work on this a little, just to be on the safe side. How do we know whether we are nervous or not? One of the simplest ways, of course, is to study uh, the irritation level of the individual. What does it take to bother you? How far can you stand certain pressures or stress without reacting in some kind of a semi-irrational way? Are you able to hold your temper well? Or does it come to a point where an explosion is almost inevitable? One of the most common problems is to find out whether other people can disagree with you on almost any subject without causing irritation to you. A calm, placid temperament is much less inclined to develop various types of psychic stress. If you have an agitated temperament, or a temperament that agitates quickly and easily, you should consider the effect of this upon the immediate environment. In this case, the immediate environment is your own health. Wherever stress arises in the personality, rates of vibration are set up that disturb normal functions. An individual who is extremely nervous develops a series of ailments which result from lack of nerve control. The more nervous we are, the more likely we are to have at least minor physical complications that are distressing and uh, uncomfortable. We know, for example, that Tension affects elimination, it affects digestion, and it very much affects sleep patterns. Wherever the person is essentially tense, one of the symptoms is an occasional hysterical outburst. Some feel that this is a very necessary and useful means of letting off steam. But uh, thoughtfulness indicates that it is better to keep the steam low all the time than take a chance that it may burst the boiler on certain occasions. In order to be really in control of yourself, you must be able to meet unusual circumstances with comparative relaxation. I know a case of a very well-equipped executive secretary. This particular secretary was well integrated, uh, very matter-of-fact, impersonal, self-contained, and apparently the very embodiment of detached efficiency. One day, however, the secretary made a kind of curious mistake. There was a large filing cabinet, and the secretary made the mistake of opening the two or three upper drawers too far. The result is that the filing cabinet started to tip over. The, uh, it lost its balance point. Uh, the secretary managed to get it back on its proper basis, but had a practical nervous breakdown as a result of the incident. They had to go home and remain home two or three days to get over it. Now, it probably wasn't so much the tipping of the filing cabinet as it was the sudden realization that this matter-of-fact, purely business attitude 
which had been carefully cultivated would, would not hold in even a small emergency. Behind it was again the pressure of a natural tendency to emotional distress. So we watch people as they go along through life, and we find that certain persons apparently have to have periods of emotional or hysterical intensity. They seem to require the shock of letting off from themselves a static kind of electricity which threatens to become a serious issue. Most of this type of hysterical, hysterical reaction, however, is not a genuine ailment. It is simply the result of habit. It is the result of personal intensity. It may be as the result of a certain frustration of a desire at a moment. And uh, all kinds of minor tensions can cause moments of hysteria or hysterical reactions. These sometimes develop in children uh, where a child discovers that a tantrum produces the desired result. The tantrum is very apt to become habitual. If a person has tantrums in their teens or even earlier, they generally make a very important discovery. Other people do not like to be made uncomfortable by the disposition of an emotionally stressful person. Anyway, they will do what they can to prevent the stress from developing. As a result of that, the stressful person gets to have their own way. They are allowed to do as they please. Everyone is scatters and lets them have things the way they want them to be. This is a very vital discovery. It places the person in a position to control environment by the development of an unpleasant disposition. They uh, get their own way. They are catered to. No one wishes to argue with them. And where uh, this type of situation exists, a very important series of lessons is lost. When uh, someone acts unpleasantly and we decide to simply retire from the situation, the result is the unpleasant person has lost an important possibility for personal growth. They would have been far better off if the, those around them had stood up on their feet and opposed an hysterical attitude, but uh, it becomes unpleasant, it becomes tedious, and sometimes even expensive. So rather than to face this emergency, uh, the individual is given into until their disposition is properly spoiled, and they will carry this through life. Wherever an emergency arises, they will seek to get their own way by an ex exhibition of unpleasant disposition. Now, we all have a tendency to degree to cultivate this situation. We have a feeling, for example, that if we talk louder than the other person, we are proving something. That we win a debate by some emotional outburst. Actually, we win nothing. But there are a great many people who mistake emotion for rationality and believe that they win by an exhibition of temper rather than by solid judgment or knowledge. If you find this tendency arising in yourself, if you find the inclination to bluff, to try to force your way through by intensifying emotion, you are probably uh, subject to a mon modified form of hysterical reaction. Actually, wherever the human being wishes to make the most out of life, it is very necessary to be able to accept that which is not always agreeable. 
We must be able to face disagreement with calmness and with kindness and attentiveness. We are here to learn and not to overwhelm someone else by the intensities of our reactions. We are not well off if we permit any form of stress to compensate for lack of judgment. Everyone must try to judge uh, the proper values of things. And to do this, we should be relaxed, we should be self-contained and poised, and we should be very attentive uh, to information that may not particularly please us, but which may be very important for our well-being. Actually, most persons have a tendency to provide emotional outbursts as a result of some form of emotional frustration or disturbance in a related field. The individual who has no outlets, therefore, is very apt to develop hysterical tendencies. If we have good physical activities, if we are engaged in sports and tennis or in golf or things of that nature, or we have interesting hobbies and avocational outlets, if we are able to keep the mind more or less concerned with constructive activities, there is very much less likelihood that we will uh, become emotionally distressed. One of the uh, avenues which shows this up uh, clearly is the field of sports. The loser has to be a good sport. And if the loser loses his disposition and becomes unpleasant, he is a double loser. He not only has lost the sport, but he has lost control of himself. We take it for granted in a field of sport that the winner and the loser should be still friends, should recognize uh, the circumstances, and not permit disappointment, chagrin, or mortification uh, to interfere with a pleasant acceptance of loss. We have to learn this. Now, when we go out in the world where sports are not exactly as pleasant as they are uh, on a tennis court or in a swimming pool, we also have to learn uh, to be good sports. If we are a good sport, we will not have very much of danger of the hysterical reaction. It is wounded ego sometimes that causes it. It is the sense of defeatism, of chagrin, and actually it is resentment against a victorious rival. In life also, it can be a resentment against the failure to get what we want when we want it. A resentment that we are not able to keep up with other people. All kinds of chagrin can result in the gradual building up of this tendency to a reaction of hysterical proportions. Now, we have to study the human body a little bit in this and the uh, factors that are behind it. Behind the physical body of the individual, there is what is called an energy field. This is more or less a magnetic zone. It is an energy distributing area that corresponds with the maintenance of our vital resources. This field of um, vital energy is not actually a being in itself. It is this structure within our invisible natures which results in the manifestation of most of the physical body functions. It is responsible for the circulation of the blood, and it also maintains the magnetic content of the blood. It contains a nutritional factor, and if allowed to function in its normal way, this magnetic field is the basis of reasonable health. It is this field which supports and nourishes the body, just as food nourishes the physical body. Its magnetic field nourishes functions. It nourishes the invisible causes and sources of our visible activities. It is the base of be, basis of our feeling well, 
or are feeling ill. And anything that interferes with the distribution of energy through the body is almost certainly going to affect health and disposition at the same time. The magnetic field is almost entirely responsible for what we call disposition. It has to do with the attitudes that result from adequate or inadequate distribution of energy resources. The individual who is tired all the time doesn't have as good a disposition as one who feels better. The person who is constantly depleted in energies is likely to develop negative attitudes, is apt to become pessimistic, and lose control of the nervous functions of the body. If, therefore, we find a tendency to unusual fatigue, if we find that the body is not supporting us reasonably well, we have a series of possible solutions. One, of course, is nutrition, by means of which we provide the body with certain basic elements and chemicals and materials which it needs for the maintenance of its structure. But the magnetic field of the body makes use of the structure which is supported by nutrition. The magnetic field, more or less, functions through the level of the bodily nutrition. It is not the source of it, but it does use it as a bridge or means of getting into the physical consciousness or disposition of the person. Therefore, uh, the nutritional side, building up physical resources, provides in due time a better field for the manifestation of the magnetic field. This problem of maintaining the magnetic balance is a very intricate one. It is this magnetic field which constantly recharges us and gives us the, in the, the ability uh, to work and do the things that are necessary. As in the case of an automobile, we put gasoline in the tank, but we still need the electric system. The gasoline in the tank is the nutrition. The electrical system is the magnetic field. Without either, the structure and function of the car is practically impossible. So having this combination in mind, we then have to consider how the magnetic field itself is affected in its function of protecting our health. As we know from the old records and from a great deal of ancient and more modern research, the magnetic field of the human being is a kind of envelope. It is a kind of egg-like structure, invisible, but surrounding the body with a field or aura of energy. This field or aura has a circumference, and that which is within this circumference forms a kind of pool of resource. It gives us the basis of our magnetic nutritional support. Now, this particular field is vulnerable in several ways. Magnetic energy is very largely under the control of various pressure-making mechanisms within us. If, for example, the physical body is allowed to run down, then the flow of magnetic energy into the body is impaired. Now, where an impairment of this kind occurs, we also sometimes have a byproduct that is unpleasant. If the energy cannot flow properly through the body, it may break out in various areas and parts with conditions that are malefic or evil. It may create growths and things of this nature because it cannot function properly through the structure of the body. When the uh, magnetic field is blocked, of course, the immediate reaction is loss of vitality. There is a kind of loss that is not to be compensated for by nutrition alone. The individual tries to eat more, may eat rapid energy foods, particularly carbohydrates, in an effort to regain this sense of well-being. If he is very, very foolish, he will attempt to do it with alcohol. 
But this, again, only results in further depletion and further destruction of the magnetic resources. Actually, the only way in which the magnetism flowing into the body can be maintained properly is when the channels for its distribution are kept in a healthy condition. Now, these channels react very definitely to attitudes. The physical body, basically, it does not react well if it is not properly maintained. If the laws governing the body are violated, the energy field is not able to come through properly and take care of the person. Also, the emotional nature has an influence on the energy field. The feelings of the individual are also nourished by energy. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our physical functions are energy sustained. And wherever this energy sustenance is disturbed, we are going to have a reaction that gradually extends through all parts of the corporeal structure. The different fields of energy have their rules and laws. And Oriental philosophy has long understood this and tried to make it a part of our normal regimen of conduct. The maintenance of man's nutritional energy derived directly or indirectly from the sun, derived also less directly but perhaps more empirically from the whole cosmos, the cosmic energy which finally seeps its way into the mechanism of the individual human being, has rules that have to be kept. If these rules are not kept, health will not be maintained. These rules include, mostly, the proper regulation of the processes of assimilation and excretion. The processes that keep the body healthy. The body must have the energy necessary to transmute alchemically nutrition into body strength. It must also have the power and ability to maintain the functions of discarding that which is no longer useful. Otherwise, we have come against a problem, that, namely that if there is a blockage in the flow of energy from the sun through the magnetic field by way of the spleen into the body, and from the body through the functions of the body's body. If these processes are disturbed, if this distribution system is damaged, then we begin to add up to problems, difficulties. And we have learned from the study of nature and from the realizations of the wise that the only way in which this flow can be normal is if the person through which it is flowing is normal. Unless the person who is, whose body is under consideration is living in harmony with natural process, we cannot expect these processes to function properly. Now, there are problems here that we can't completely control. Uh, we cannot control the pollutions which affect the planet at this time. We cannot uh, control entirely uh, the adulterations of the food products that we eat. We cannot completely control the bad habits which are necessary, apparently, to maintain our economic survival. And we cannot control the endless irritation arising in our relationships with other human beings, either intimately personal or collectively social. So the individual has certain problems, some of which he is not going to be able to completely solve, all of which, however, can be improved. And this improvement really represents a careful estimation of what we must do to retain the rhythm of relationship with natural energy resources. If we break this rhythm, if we dis disregard it, we are in trouble and always will be. 
the answer for the most part is the one that the hardest for us as average persons to uh, achieve, namely simple quietude, a, sen a sense of non-resistance to fact. About uh, now in our political history, most people are batting their heads against bulwarks that they cannot overcome, and most people are unable to handle facts. They resent them, they downgrade them, they know they're not right, but they also have another fact that in most cases there is nothing the individual can do about it. Therefore, the main problem with all this difficulty is to retain as far as possible a normal relationship with life. Actually, we have to live with our own relationships. We have to live with the kind of world our minds, emotions, and energies and intensities create for us. And we must keep the pressure low. If we do not keep the pressure low, we are going to have these occasional or sometimes regular outbursts of dispositional violence. We have always had them to some degree, but they are becoming more intensive and are probably best indicated by the violence which is breaking out all over the world. Violence that is representing, represented by murder, uh, by all kinds of crime, by international discords, and by a continuous development of irritations. Today, it is almost impossible to find a country that is not dramatically irritated about something. And it's hard to find an individual who is not irritated about something. Now, irritation is an irritant. It is not a force for good. Any stimulation that seems to come from irritation is false. The individual is therefore gradually undermining himself and deflecting from its proper purposes the energy of the sun upon which he must live. He is therefore taking this energy and abusing it to maintain his grudges rather than using it to develop the resources of his own nature. This philosophy might not be so sound in its applications if we lived here forever. If our physical existence in one life was to extend for two or three thousand years, there would be another type of point to consider. But with only a comparatively moderate span of life, the possibility of a solution of the major problems which concern us, this possibility is very slight. Instead of trying to solve them by a head-on collision, the best thing that we can do is to relax and try to plan and devise as rational and intelligent a method of handling these problems as is possible to us. Where we don't know how to do this and where we cannot achieve some form of control over our own reactions, we come to these hysterical outbreaks. We come to the point where we can't take the stress any longer. Something has to give. In politics, this ends in riots, ends in civil war, ends in rebellions. And on another level, it ends in the disruption of our economic, industrial, and even our agricultural systems. Therefore, the reward of violence is hunger, pain, and destruction. And yet violence is so close to the surface in most of us that it takes a certain amount of care and thought to make sure that it doesn't erupt unpleasantly. Now, this is for the problem of hysterical outbreaks. Now, let's consider for a moment the other aspect of this problem, and that is hysteria per se. Hysteria as a clinical ailment, as a diagnosable disease, uh, is rather different uh, from the hysterical outbreaks of the individual who lacks self-control. Very often, a serious hysteria represents a psychological problem, and it also can definitely represent a long hereditary pattern 
a great deal hysteria in its pure sense. It is hereditary. It is not necessarily carried forward through the bloodstream, but it is carried downward through the psychological integration of several generations of forebears. Hysteria, therefore, of this type is very often not accompanied by any of the common symptoms that we refer to as hysterical. In a great many cases, hysteria has no visible symbolism of violence. Hysteria may be a complete neurotic withdrawal. The individual may retire completely into themselves and remain isolated. In this case, the general attitude is that the person is licking his wounds. Actually, however, uh, hysteria can be a withdrawal from society. When it is this, it is often the result of a bruise or a struggle or a painful circumstance. Clinical hysteria is probably one of the ailments which has contributed to the monastic way of life. It is the cause of many persons departing from the material world and its activities and retiring into the cloister or coming into a lonely, isolated life or going out and living in the wilderness by themselves. One of the uh, problems of hysteria, therefore, is escape through isolation. Now, this escape through isolation does not necessarily mean that the person recognizes that he is directly running away from something. He simply finds that his nervous system, his sensitivities, and his sensibilities are such that almost every material contact hurts him. He finds that instead of uh, being able to cope with things, he is bruised, he is disillusioned, he is disappointed. And as the condition extends itself through his life, it finally can reach the point in which the person is disillusioned in everything, even in himself. This type of complete withdrawal is a very difficult type of ailment to face or to work with, but it is something that has to be considered uh, from a psychological standpoint. Now, this withdrawal, however, may and often is associated with some uh, mechanism that justifies it. Very few people withdrawing from life or wanting to live in an isolated way simply say they don't want to meet people or they do not want to be around people. There is a reason that gradually develops in the psychic integration that makes the thing they do not want to do increasingly difficult for them to do. One of the kinds of problems, therefore, is a development of a whole series of pseudo-ailments, many of which are still diagnosed as major diseases when actually they are hysteria. One type of hysteria, for example, can be a pseudo-heart trouble. Many cases of so-called angina pectoris, which is a painful and dangerous ailment of the heart, is not a heart ailment at all. It is simply a form of hysteria. It is something in which the individual has gradually developed a symbolic mechanism to prove why he cannot do the thing that subconsciously he doesn't want to do. Another type of ailment that comes along in this type of thing is hysterical paralysis. A person may have every symptom of paralysis, and yet it is not a genuine case. It is a case of a person who is trying in one way or another uh, to accomplish a definite purpose, either withdrawal into self or the creation of sympathy on the outside by which the person comes to be catered to or taken care of as an, as an infant might be. It is therefore an, a regression into infant dependence. A very good example of one of these cases is a clinical story of a paralyzed person in a wheelchair who had not walked for years. 
who was Uriah, was seated by the side of a swimming pool in a wheelchair when one of her grandchildren fell in the pool. The child could not swim and began to sink and scream for help. The woman who hadn't walked in years got to her feet, got into the pool, and swam to the child, brought it on shore, got out of the pool herself, and did not go back to the chair. Yet she had been diagnosed as a hopeless paralytic. This paralysis was therefore a psychic form of hysteria. It was something that gradually developed all of the symptoms of the genuine thing, but which actually did not have any foundation in the legitimate circumstances and conditions associated with paralysis. Now this has a, a bearing on another field that is interesting, maybe somewhat controversial, but I think in all fairness to all concerned we should mention it, namely the problem of faith healing. Now all faith healing is not working with hysteria, there's no question about that. But there are cases in which faith has produced the release from hysteria. If faith is stronger than fear in a particular case, and the cause is hysteria rather than the actual ailment, it is quite possible for the faith to make the individual uh, have the strength of character to recover from their ailment. The attitude being, of course, that the individual is not recovering by their own effort, but the concept which arises in the mind and consciousness, namely that any person united with God equals a majority, and therefore that the presence of the divine accomplishes a miracle. Now there are people also who have various recoveries from ordinary ailments. Most doctors are aware of the importance of the bread pill. There is a mass of hypochondria floating around in this world. In the more obvious and simpler forms, we are able to cope with it fairly well. But there comes a time in hysteria in which the ailment arri arrives at, pro at uh, proportions that are very difficult to cope with. <coughs> this situ situation is always possible where we have lack of emotional integration and personal control. If, for example, the individual is gradually building character, particularly if they are using some simple but effective self-disciplines, and are also determined to devote their lives to useful purposes, the tendency is for nature to step in and help them cure their various hyster hysterias. For example, the person who goes out into the wilderness to live by themselves because the world hurts them, or because they have a feeling that this complete absenteeism from society is a spiritual grace, these people very often just get worse. They cuddle their own hysteria to the end of life and never realize the mistake they are making. If a person with a tendency in this direction would turn around immediately and forget self and dedicate life to the service of that which is in need, if these persons who are unable to stand the pressures of society take on problems or burdens of helping people, of serving, of going out and doing good every day in some practical and simple manner, there is a great probability that their hysteria will be overcome. I know one case in which a man, teacher in a university, was finally required to uh, retire because he developed a very strange stammer. It became a problem of stuttering. He took uh, a number of courses in recovery, gained some benefit from them, but in a short time the stammering returned. Uh, during World War II, uh, there was a shortage of, of teachers, and this man offered 
to volunteer to take on the work he had prom previously done if the class would accept the limitation of speech. He could talk, but it was not fluent, and it was often broken by the stammering. After consideration, the student group, it was not a very large class, it was a highly specialized subject, agreed that it was better to have him than nobody. So they said, all right, we will adjust to him and try to be good students under him. So he started in and he taught for the best part of two years. And after the first month, the stammering began to disappear. And before the term was over, he was speaking perfectly. And the, yes, he told me, I knew the man, he told me that the reason this change took place was a constantly increasing sense within himself that he had to do better, that he couldn't fail these young people, that he had to get the information across. And by degrees, this determination to accomplish the purpose resulted in a complete correction of what had been diagnosed as an incurable state of affairs. So we note that wherever there is a tendency to a morbid hysteria, where hysteria is an escape mechanism, or where an individual is unable to accomplish what is necessary or has no necessity in life, the first problem is to try and meet this need by a practical commitment of some kind. One problem, of course, that is not uh, generally recognized is the fact that parents, when their children are grown, generally find their lives are less important. They have done their job, that birds have flown and are building homes of their own, or they're out in the world making their way, and the parents become more or less free. And I suppose we may say that freedom of this kind is a principal cause of hysteria. Hysteria is something that generally comes along where, as the old saying was, the devil finds something for idle hands to do. And the person who has no dramatic drive who may have been fairly busy, but may be a little sorry for themselves most of the way. Parents raising children find it a mixed blessing. But they also come in time uh, to recognize the responsibility and carry on. They're perfectly certain that when the job is over, they're going to rest. When they come to rest, they find they cannot. They have had too much activity, and furthermore, the average person who is resting begins to recognize resources within themselves which they have neglected. A, uh, a young, liberated parent in their 40s or early 50s may find that it's very advisable to go back into business or go back into their profession. If they do not go into something that is constructive and purposeful, then they begin gradually to develop a certain sense of frustration. They are sorry for themselves, but they do not know it. They are not functioning constructively or purposefully. And as a result, this tendency to hysteria develops. And it can become very, very serious if something isn't done to correct it. Another cause for genuine hysteria is pain. There are a great many people who in the course of life pass through long periods of pain. Uh, there are those who have, for example, been wounded or injured in war or in the uh, general accidents of industrial society. There are others who have developed ailments which are not entirely curable but can be often uh, controlled, but there will be pain. Pain is a constant nag. Some ailments are much more painful than others, and many of the most painful of all are associated with advancing years. Pain of this type can result in a kind of hysteria. It can become a nerve problem so acute that it affects every aspect of the temperament and character. Yet persons with this kind of pain 
would like to be and often think they are brave enough to handle the situation. They do not want to admit it. They do not want to wish it on their friends. They do not wish to be hampered and to become objects of pity. Yet this pain goes on. And if it is secreted, held within, and lived with over a period of years, it can result in some type of hysteria. Now, hysterias are not always in the form of ailments. Hysterias can be in the form of addictions or in the form of dedications to unusual or peculiar uh, services in life. One of the outlets for hysteria has always been religion, because in religion the individual comes under the pressure of a tremendous power of suggestion. And many uh, hysterical of his, uh, persons or genuine cases of hysteria are benefit by, benefited by religious allegiances. They also very frequently carry with them activities. The religious dedication may lead to the ministry. It may lead to various social problems. It may cause the individual to take part in world plans for the benefit of the sick, the poor, or the troubled. And in religion, there is a field of service. And in this field of service, the tendency to hysteria is markedly reduced. It is the outlet that prevents the individual from simply living constantly mindful of his own aches and pains. Therefore, if a person has any kind of a physical disability that is uncomfortable or humiliating or uh, a rhythmic source of self-condemnation or self-pity, such an individual should most certainly find an outlet, should not pause at all until they are able to extrovert their inner tensions. Now, this extroversion is something that the various people try to approach in different ways. Generally speaking, a release from hysteria must be involved in some kind of a direct physical activity. We must channel this energy. We must take this magnetic substance which is coursing through us and give it a proper outlet. Therefore, hysteria is seldom uh, corrected merely by a voluntary mental statement. It is seldom ex uh, corrected simply by listening to others or becoming uh, converted to something. The, the true solution lies in the development of an energy activity which reopens and restores the flow of the magnetic forces in the human body. Therefore, the individual who wishes to uh, give their lives to a religious purpose will find it very wise to find some religious outlet in which they are busy, in which they are physically involved, that their time is in use, that they are definitely doing something useful, something they are proud of themselves. Otherwise, the therapy will not be what they have hoped it would be. Another cure for hysteria if you can find the way to work it, is in the case of improving personal knowledge. Uh, the man who graduated from medical school with his degree of doctor of medicine in the same class with his own son is an example of this. A person who had reached an age of liberty and freedom, yet was not fulfilled. Where the life is not fulfilled, Self-pity is more likely, and a great deal of hysteria is founded in self-pity. So the, if other factors are not conducive to security or release, the individual can advance an educational program, taking on subjects that he was unable to complete during his earlier years. He can go every day, he can earn a degree, or he can go without credit simply by going. He can take up languages, he can take up art or music, whatever his own personal life seems to need. But he must have something. He cannot solve it simply by sitting down in front of a machine and listening to someone else play music. 
he must become involved. He must become one of those doing it, even if it's done very amateurishly. There are cases of musicians whose music is never beautiful except to themselves. But it is that which is the important part. It is the satisfaction of self-expression. This is very, very important. Now, other types of uh, hysteria sometimes result from a repetition of unhappy incidents. A person who has a series of bereavements, uh, and this seems as though a, an ill fortune or an adverse fate was dogging their footsteps. A person who, having found happiness and security, had it suddenly taken away from them. The sudden loss of that which is important is very often involved in hysteria, especially if this loss is one of companionship. Those who have gone through this experience can and very often do feel a certain sense of heartbrokenness. They are never going to be able to recover from the loss. They are going to always remember the tragedy, and in the course of life, most people manage to accumulate two or three tragedies, so that this pattern, once it's established, can cause the person to escape or deny participation in life. Where this happens, there is always a great danger of hysteria. Another problem that we are now beginning to realize and have not noted sufficiently in the past is that the treating of hysteria can often contribute to it. The individual who is under these various pressures may, in some instances, uh, seek help and be medicated. Now, a medication for hysteria or for hysterical outbreaks is a very uncertain way of handling the situation. It is known, of course, that there are a great many neo-psychotics who are on medication constantly and as a result are able to return to society with reasonable success. Uh, these cases uh, we are not going to dwell upon too much, but I'd like to point out that where medication can accomplish these procedures, there is always the possibility that the protection given by the medication temporarily could gradually uh, invite the patient to the correction of the cause in himself. But if the cause is as frequently it is, is hysteria, the hysteria itself cannot be medicated, only the symptoms. Therefore, if the person is the condition they are in because of a very basic dispositional or temperamental deficiency, this has to be considered in its own right. For example, there are a great many young people who in this day and age develop either superiority or inferiority complexes. The, the inferiority complex can sometimes be bolstered up, but the superiority complex is an extremely difficult thing to live with, not only for the person, but for all around them. The individual who really feels that they are destiny's darling and have been frustrated all the way along, very often develop definite hysteria and actually become involved in what are now considered to be pathological symptoms. The person with, the, with the, an inflated ego who cannot accomplish their purpose uh, will have the tendency to develop hysteria. Now, the reason for this is very simple. The will to be, the desire to be, the conviction that one can be is grouped at one end of a situation. At the other end of the situation, is a personality that is incapable of fulfilling those pressures. The individual is, in their inner life, a magnificent example of superiority, but in daily living is more likely an example of inferiority. 
they are not apparently able to do anything important. And as they are not interested in doing anything that isn't important, the limitations of their own development, or as Lavata always called it, the problem of organic quality, in which the body and the brain and the nervous system were not suitable to the ambitions of the ego. Where this condition exists, you have a, a condition in which hysteria can very often develop and does and becomes pathological. The individual simply cannot get well so long as they believe that health means the inalienable right to dominate other people, to do, do whatever they please themselves, to be completely superior, when in reality they simply haven't the capacity for it. This type of hysteria needs reorientation, but is very difficult to get. These people do not marry well. They do not become good parents. They often have abilities sufficient to make a good living if they use them. Uh, but much of the time they will be out of employment because of these tension and stress periods that develop within themselves. If a person wants to have a fairly good life, it is much better for everyone to be moderate in their ambitions, very grateful for the abilities that they have, and try to enlarge and expand their usefulness without overdoing or developing uh, psychoses of grandeur, uh, of something that is not even possible to be fulfilled. Now, there are certain cases also in which the individual comes into a state through shock. Shock may be a very terrible physical shock, as a great and severe accident, or a psychic shock, as a case of infidelity in marriage, or a tragedy in the loss of a child, or the collapse of a business or the sudden realization that the individual is afflicted with a serious and maybe fatal ailment. All of these things can produce shock. And shock has a tendency to short-circuit the magnetic field. The result of the shock is that the entire system goes out of whack. The individual in their psychological, in their endocrine structure, and in their functional structure has blown a fuse. And this can be a, a very serious and uh, troublesome problem. Once, however, the shock begins to subside, nature steps in. In order to have a shock endure, the individual must support it beyond the pattern of the incident itself. We cannot suffer the same pain twice. We may have a new pain, but we cannot suffer the old one but once. We cannot go through a certain experience itself but once. There may be other experiences. But somewhere within ourselves, we have to face up to the problem of these experiences that do arise. We can hope they will not come in our lives, but they may. Where this type of thing occurs, the individual, shocked, retires from humanity. They retire into themselves this shock gradually becomes chronic. Now, when the uh, individual blows the fuse and it is re uh, replaced in the near future, the circuit goes back into action. But if the circuit is left without being repaired over a long period of time, it may become incurably broken. Therefore, wherever there is a stress of great intensity, the problem of recovery becomes an immediate situation to face. The person must gradually rise above the problem that is confronting him. He must get away from the issue. Sometimes he will wait too long to try to do so. I know several cases in which persons under very heavy loss or under tragedy were advised, for instance, to go away for a while. They were told that if they would take a nice long vacation somewhere or take a trip to some interesting place, it would help them. Well, the advice is more or less traditional, but it does help in some cases. 
but much depends on how soon it is done. If an individual says yes, uh, I realize there's nothing more I can do here, the situation is set finished, I'll book the next uh, plane to Europe or something of that nature and try to get away from it, try to rebuild something. If he does it this way, he has a fair chance of success. But if he says, I don't think I can do it now, and he waits for a year or two to get around to doing it, the probabilities of improvement are very small unless he is already improving from other causes. If a sudden condition creates a short circuit in our lives, it is better for it to be faced again by an immediate, sudden, constructive experience that will help to take up or compensate for the problem that is unhappy. Now, hysteria can also result in various complications of ailments. You can have, uh, for instance, a, an hysterical stomach. Uh, stomach hysteria is of two kinds. Uh, one is the chronic type that arises from the fact that the nervous system in its symbolism has fixed upon the digestion and the stomach uh, as a particularly weak area in which uh, it can uh, release its intemperances. Uh, a person who is finicky in food, who develops all kinds of antagonisms towards foods, will develop sometimes hysteria if forced to eat foods that cause this attitude. One of the major, most common reasons for that is dieting, where a person, in order to accomplish a medical or medicinal diet or a cosmetic diet, is forced to live largely on food that they object to. This type of food usually will not digest well, and the result is irritation in the stomach and the possibility of ulceration. Of course, on the other hand, shock or stress will cause a sinking feeling in the solar plexus, which is related to the stomach and digestive system. And in some simple words, hysterical outbreaks injure digestion. And by so doing, they badly unbalance body chemistry. As a result of a bad dispositional outburst, the entire digestive, assimilative, and excretory systems are adversely affected. The more nervous, the more excitable, the more tense the person is, the more he's likely to have problems of elimination and digestion. Now, most people today complain of this type of problem, and a great number of persons are using various artificial means to improve elimination. The best way to improve it, actually, is to maintain a proper constructive attitude while eating. While uh, the, if an individual carries a grudge to the dinner table, he is going to regret it. The Chinese found that out a long time ago. They also found out that the meal wasn't improved if the cook had a grudge. And uh, while we are not sure that the, those, the purveyors of TV dinners have grudges, still, perhaps the indifference, the complete commercialization, the lack of thoughtfulness, the lack of individual involvement in the preparation of these prepared foods may have an effect upon their digestibility, regardless of the quality of the merchandise, which is incidentally likely not to be too good. But the, the person who is irritated, uncomfortable, and unhappy will have stomach trouble, will not be able to eat properly, will have erratic eating habits, and will have poor elimination, and will be worried to death about everything, their children, their world, and all about it. It all sets into a pattern. The individual who enjoys his food is far less likely to be an hysterical person simply because he finds relaxation and the digestive processes go on unimpaired. The moment we impair a function, we begin to a, a defect, defeat a disposition. The moment we defeat a disposition, 
we use the magnetic energy of our invisible uh, electrical equipment unwisely. We begin to pervert energy. The perversion of energy can do all kinds of things. One problem we're having now is uh, the problem of what happens in an accident where we are having uh, uh, atomic or neutronic research. Uh, we know that the, uh, the nuclear waste is endangering the planet. Now, with our own little way of life, we have nuclear waste also inside of ourselves. Wherever we use natural forces unwisely, we are doing the same thing that humanity is doing when it is using universal energy to create an instrument of destruction. Destructive attitudes have their, have their energy wastes in our bodies. These wastes point up and develop into toxins. And the more toxic we are, the more subject we will be to some type of hysteria. Uh, where there is a good digestion and the individual sleeps well, hysteria is not so much of a problem. This brings sleep into focus. One of the most interesting problems of sleep is that it can be a defense mechanism and it can be an escape mechanism. The individual may retire into sleep to avoid the world. He may have retire into sleep to restore the body, which is its most natural and proper usage. He may also attempt to escape into a world of fantasy. Sleep may be a way of getting away from himself, forgetting his own existence. If he wants to forget his own existence, he likes to sleep a long time. If, on the other hand, he is too busily engaged in almost any activity that requires consciousness, he may become short-circuited in his sleeping mechanism and not get rest enough. The uh, actual person who is suffering from hysteria is often a poor sleeper. He has problems of rest, which have not been solved. He may go to sleep, but he will wake up tired and unrefreshed. He will find difficulty in getting back to sleep, and then the awful thing happens. The individual begins to think. And by the time he has thought his way through every impossible situation that might arise in his conscious life, by the time he has remembered every misery he ever went through, and becomes ever fearful of the outcome of his present undertakings, he is really in a, in a sad way. Uh, to meet this emergency, we have the famous aspirin remedies by the millions. And the sale of these indicates, beyond doubt, that a very large part of our population does not sleep well. And that does not mention the group that are under medical uh, sleeping aids but simply those who are trying to get away from the pressure of the day. Now, sleep has a good answer to many problems for us. Much concerning sleep and rest is involved in what happens an hour or two before you go to sleep. The last point of the day, the hour or half hour before you hope to sleep, should be in some way an invitation to rest. It can be good music, it can be a good book read for a time, it can be uh, good thoughts, it can be plans for better things to do tomorrow, it can be reminiscence over the joys of life, or a very devotional attitude of gratitude uh, to the world, to God, and to our friends and family for the many benefits that we enjoy. All the things that go ahead of the sleeping period should be constructive. And everything that has to be uh, held in abeyance because it isn't so happy should not be involved in sleep. A great many reports are coming in of the det detrimental effect of television programming on sleep. Uh, the individual who just finishes a program with four or five murders in it and then tries to go to sleep is apt to find that his nervous system 
and his temperament in general is not able to handle uh, the conditioning of the film. Uh, actually, uh, we try very often to condition people constructively in psychoanalysis. But when we are confronted by persons who spend six to eight hours a day being adversely conditioned by entertainment, we have very little chance of catching up uh, with the evil that is done uh, by uncontrolled, unregulated entertainment. It is just one of those things. We carry into sleep the fantasies of the screen or the tube, and, uh, as, and as a result, we have a bad case of insomnia. Now, other ways of helping insomnia, of course, is to realize that usually we sleep because we're tired. Your neurotic is tired all the time, but only mentally and emotionally. They do not have adequate physical exhaustion or fatigue. Therefore, physical activity, uh, well-disciplined but adequate, is extremely useful in producing the pattern of sleep and wake which is proper to the individual. Consequently, a life in which there is a reasonable amount of physical activity is more or less necessary. Another problem that confronts a great many people is the ever-increasing problem of finance. How to meet and cope with the inflationary cycles that are disturbing us at the present time. Many persons are now being forced to restrict their activities. They're not able to spend the money they would spend normally. If a few seem to have more, there are many that have less. And this problem interferes with man's escape mechanisms. If he can go out and spend substantially every evening, or if he can travel widely, or if he can entertain elaborately, he has a certain sense of fulfillment. But if a person who has depended entirely upon what he has for his happiness finds that he is no longer able to indulge these appetites, then the self-pity factor comes in. The person who, who likes to extrovert, but because of financial restriction must sit home or must limit his activity as a spender, develop self-pity and also may be uh, more apt to have emotional outbursts. He is not able to be what he thinks he should be. He is not uh, getting the diversions that he thinks are proper. Now, the problem of how to handle all these things in life and to get what you can out of it comes back to the essential principle of what are we here for? What are we trying to do? Why do we live in this world? Are we living here to cuddle our faults or get over them? Are we here to nurse our weaknesses or try to correct them? Are we here to be big-time spenders or are we here to be big-time learners? What is the purpose for life? Nearly all hysteria arises from false evaluation of purpose. The individual who has no vision of purpose and he lives entirely on the pressures of the moment, of course, is in a very weak situation. If these pressures become excessive, he's in serious trouble. But our real problem here is not to nurse our weaknesses. It is not to be always remembering the disasters of the past. It isn't even a problem of trying to understand the present administration which is causing considerable activity. For a great many people, before this administration gets too much further one way or the other, they will depart from this world anyway, leaving the administration behind. And in the course of time, we will leave every administration behind. History is a proof that we are leaving the past behind every moment. Therefore, while it is proper for us to study processes, look for weaknesses, and contemplate corrections. These attitudes must be those of a scholar, a student, a young person in school. We are in this world to learn. 
and it is the learning that counts. And when the learning goes sour in ourselves, then we are all ready for hysteria. It is the individual who cannot take the lesson, who feels that it is their duty to suffer, when it's not their duty to suffer, unless they wish to reject the multiplication table and the alphabet. We are here to solve the problem of our own existence, and in the solving of it, to solve the problem of universal existence. They're all tied together. We're down here in this particular environment because we need it, because we've earned it, and because we have to live out in it many processes and patterns which we established long ago. If we were born into this world as a neurotic, and a lot of people are, or if we have a congenital hysteria, it means we have brought with us a load of unfinished business. It means that we were a failure before, or at least we're not completely successful. And if we do exactly what we did before, we will stay hysteria in hysteria throughout the present life. If, however, we are tired of what we came with and decide that it's better to do something about it, we are not only getting ourselves out of the present emergency, but we are curing the larger pattern which we brought with us. There's nothing that we can do in this world that is as valuable as the proper use of the equipment with which we have been endowed. We all have a whole group of values. We have a mind which is capable of being worn out, tired, miserable, sick, and disillusioned, or a great idealistic opportunity to, to, for beauty, for wisdom, for knowledge, for the searching out of values. We have emotions that can make us hysterical, can make us hate everything that we do and everyone that we know. And we also have emotions that have created great music, great art, great literature, and a world of splendid creativity. We have a body which is more or less a tired, worn-out thing by the time we get here. It would seem as though we carry a body that carries in it all the karma of a delinquent world, that we are part of a descent of bodies that have been more or less deformed and defaced by generations of heredity. We do not come here, you know, into a beautiful, perfect body. We come into a body that we've got to take hold of. If we leave it as a fragment of a great descent of biology, we have to live with that. But if we find this body needs a little work, and we get to work and do it, we gradually transform this body into a magnificent instrument of enlightened purpose. It becomes our link with our world, our link with humanity, our link with our neighbor and ourselves. Through the body, we see our own inner life reflected out into the environment in which we live. Now, hysteria and hysterical outbreaks all result from mistakes in the handling of these situations. They result in the individual not learning, even from repeated experience. They result from an individual not recognizing his needs and his weaknesses. They show a lack of dedication and they show a lack of unselfish affection and friendship. They're all forms of selfishness of some kind. They're all self-centeredness. They are all regrets over the mistakes rather than plans for the correction of them. Gradually, the individual wearing down from the pressure of years gets tired. And when he gets tired, he either weakens or relaxes. Now, if in tiring, being tired, he loses his faith in humanity, he is in trouble. But if he is tired and relaxes, and finds that in the peaceful quietude of relaxation, that he can experience for the first time his relationship to the great principles of life, then he is a wiser person. It is the privilege of everyone to be made wise by age to learn more, perhaps not all, but enough to be better when we leave than when we came. But if we settle down and refuse this, if we become so sorry for ourselves 
that we either can no longer grow or even go to the point where we wish we were out of here. With this type of situation, we have mistaken the reason for existence. And under a mistake of this kind, we have a tendency to develop hysterical symptoms. They are simply the symptoms of the uncorrected infirmities of our own natures. They are the misuse of energy. It takes just as much or more energy to worry and to grouch as it does to grow. And by the use of it for a grouch, we get another grouch. By using it to grow, we improve. And each individual has the right to try to decide for himself how he's going to use his life allotment, whether he is going to allow this flow of life from the sun and from the heavens to go through him and come through him into the fulfillment of a more glorious career. If he thinks this way, he can make it. If he thinks of this energy, however, merely as something that has been given to him so that he can suffer more, he will not find very much to reward his attitudes. So in all problems, the individual who is self-centered, selfish, and remains willfully ignorant of the beauties of life, this individual is a good candidate for either hysterical outbreaks or a chronic neurotic hysteria within his own nature. We are quite sure, of course, that all of you are all outgrow have all outgrown this problem, but it's, you can use it to help your friends anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs>